right, so Adam Trademan is on the next panel, and I, I hope he's still here. He's, he shows up on my screen, and so is Seren Bather. And so I was thinking, perhaps we should invite our other guests, and we have this final panel, and uh, the synergies that, that might uh, emerge from this will be quite interesting, because Adam has built a company called BRD, he's the CEO and co-founder of a company called BRD, and it's a digital asset platform that they've got close to 6 million users now and growing rapidly. Adam, welcome here. Suren, welcome here. Um, so I thought maybe, uh, Caroline, and Steve, and Victor, if you're okay with this, maybe we just include the rest of these guys here and, and close this panel out with the most interesting panel of the <laughs> evening. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's okay with you guys, uh, Caroline and Steve. And Listen, everyone knows how Australians travel. We're really good in a group, particularly dropped in late at night, so we're good to go. We can, we can, we can, we can go hard from here. I'm in. So, Fantastic. I, you know, I, I'd like to be able to read off the uh, resume for Adam and, and uh, it's Ren, but I think it would be best if they sort of talked about themselves. Uh, I know that Adam's building a great company. When you guys were talking about the research, the mobility in and out of trading, we had um, a panel yesterday that talked about some of the companies that BRD is doing, some of the research that they do, some of the awards that they won in inclusivity and uh, gender equality. Uh, they've got a lot of data and a lot of research on some of their users all across. It's a global company. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Adam. Just introduce yourself to the rest of the group, Seren. I'll let you do the same. And let's just make this about, um, you know, the, the, the cocktail hour, at least for me. <laughs> um, no I'll back out of here. For uh, I, I think you, you more than deserve a cocktail uh, for today, Karim. So, um, yes, Adam and, and Seren, if we can hear from you. Sure. I'm no not sure Adam right now, but I'm happy to go first. Um, they usually call okay. this the graveyard shift, but... Uh, let's make it a bit of fun. Um, look, I, I've uh, come from the traditional background of financial services, where I served uh, high net worth clients for more than 30 years, understanding their needs, the objectives. But I must admit, technology has killed me. So when, when I say that, it's made everyone smarter than me. So from charging a, a significant price per hour for my advice, uh, everyone now knows much more than me. However, there's a danger in knowing too much. And, and the trouble is with too much of information, people are frozen to make choices. And so now all I've become is a coach to help people make the right decisions. And what I've done instead is build financial products where they have to put their money at some point anyway. So I've started on traditional assets, but from what I see and hear recently in the way digitalization is growing and cryptocurrency is, is growing, um, I, I've already seen a pattern of movement of investment choice from some of my clients. I'm happy to share that you know, during this uh, presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Adam Trademan. Pleasure to be here today with everyone. Uh, I'm originally an engineer, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. I am presently based in BRD's Tokyo office, where I am uh, currently through the pandemic. Um, I basically started my career in the electronic space and had a, had a long tenure there as an entrepreneur, the founding CEO of four companies. I've raised about uh, $250, $300 million, uh, built successful products and teams, and was fortunate enough to be able to um, sell those companies for the most part uh, over in the Silicon Valley. About five years ago, I got into the crypto space after repeatedly telling uh, my current co-founder of my company uh, for about 18 months that I thought he was absolutely crazy because at the time Bitcoin was used mainly for nefarious activities. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, I thought as a businessman, things of that sort don't generally go mainstream. And uh, I think the epiphany for me uh, was uh, at, a, at a, literally a bar in the Silicon Valley. And he said to me, Adam, you know, we all thought that the internet was gonna be the most disrupting uh, invention of our lifetime. What after all could be more fundamental than disrupting human uh, communication, right? Uh, well, it turns out that, you know, it's, it's despite how big the internet is, right, money hasn't changed in its principal form in over a thousand years. And the epiphany for me was when he said, money isn't just, you know, a half of every exchange for products or services, right? It is what people and companies and governments use to control all aspects of society, truly. And not only is it ripe for disruption, after all, banking is the biggest business in the world, 
right? <laughs> but in addition to that, by virtue of changing some of these fundamental premises of how money and the global um, economy works, we could actually do a lot of good in the world too and improve a lot of things, such as for the unbanked, you know, in Africa or rural China and, and things of this sort. So I became very passionate about cryptocurrency. Uh, we started BRB in 2015. Um, as Victor and Kareem said, we now have about 6 million customers around the world. It's a uh, mobile wallet for the iPhone and Android, and it's the fastest growing crypto mobile app out there. Just a very easy and safe way for new investors to get started. And uh, in addition to that, um, today I also bring a little bit more of a perhaps unique perspective to the table. I also happen to be the CEO of two other companies. Uh, they are both affiliated with SBI, which is one of Japan's largest investment banks, originally SoftBank Investments. Um, SBI happens to be a big investor in my company, BRD. Um, but they have also asked me to lead the SBI and Ripple joint venture called SBI Ripple Asia. So in that role, I focus on cross-border uh, transactions for um, money transfers all across the world, but with a focus in the Asia region. And then I also happen to run SVI's um, mining electronics business, which is responsible for designing, um, building, manufacturing, and deploying cryptocurrency miners focused on Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. So I've kind of got a span, you know, or a cross section, if you will, of the market from all the way at the consumer side, all the way down the supply chain, back to where the Bitcoin is created from the miners. So happy to be here today and appreciate the opportunity. If I can just jump in, Adam, it's lovely to meet you. We, BTC Markets, are the Ripple ODL partner for Australia. Oh, okay, great, great. Well, <laughs> you even know awesome it. stuff. And uh, that, that's a really important technology, actually. I think that's going to be the, the biggest catalyst to help um, change a lot of cross-border payments. So I'm glad you guys are inserted in there. That's a good opportunity. I, I, I'm loving this real-time connection is happening. Um, this is fantastic. And uh, I, Adam, I, I think that's a phenomenal um, uh, background. I, I don't know how you managed to find any sleep uh, between. As you those can imagine, clubs. I have nothing but free time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, love to learn more about that, and I've got a couple of uh, questions in store for you guys. But um, I, I want to also jump, just jump back to Surin for for a moment. Uh, what he hasn't shared, uh, but I think it is um, uh, necessary for me, for me to share with the audience, is that uh, I've known Surin for a number of years now. Um, and he has run a, a very fast growing uh, uh, financial planning and wealth management practice. At one point, it um, um, employed over 400 financial advisors in Australia and managed over $5 billion of uh, clients' uh, assets. Um, and the group has uh, 12 offices around the world. So I, I think maybe he was being modest uh, in, in, not answering, uh, in not measuring that, but I, I think it's really interesting that um, uh, through our recent collaborations, uh, Surin and Sumo Group has uh, 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 entered into a joint venture uh, fund, a VC fund with the Sapien Group. Um, and we have actually invested in some uh, really exciting fintech and, and blockchain companies. Um, I, I want to sort of open this uh, out, out to the panel, uh, the following couple of questions. But, but if I can start with you, Surin. Um, representing a more traditional financial services pr perspective, if I may say that, um, what do you see as the biggest um, challenges or hesitations for, let's say, non-digital assets or non-crypto savvy investors in embracing, adopting, uh, investing in this asset category? So look, I think um, we better just take a step back to what's been happening recently. As you know, since COVID, you know, there's been a huge amount of quantitative easing worldwide, right? And this money um, effectively has been going by the banking channel to either specific companies, right? And what we've seen happen is, is a couple of things. Firstly, uh, the weight of money has moved to stock markets. It's put stock prices up. And therefore, because incomes have increased, yields have compressed, and money then has gone, you know, from the stock markets to the property markets, especially in Australia, and we've seen some amazing increases in prices, but then rental yields have an increase. So this compression of yields has now led to people thinking, you know, where do I get my income from? And yet at the same time, we've seen, especially during COVID, you know, people looking for efficiencies, you know, reducing employment, you know, and moving towards more efficiencies through using, you know, digitalization and other technologies like AI and VR. So 
I can see a sudden shift where people will move away from traditional assets that are not paying the traditional incomes and searching for new opportunities like you know, digitalization. So I think there's a huge opportunity going forward in a shift from traditional assets to the new darling of asset classes, which is, I think, digital currencies and digital opportunities. Adam? Pardon me. Uh, what are your thoughts around some of the um, potential obstacles or, or hesitancies for, let's say, more traditionally minded investors when adopting investing in digital assets? Do you agree well, with Surin? Yeah, I, I do. I think that there's, you know, what being involved in my business um, with the Ripple joint venture, we speak to a lot of central banks and tier one financial institutions. Um, and, you know, even though uh, the technology that we're talking about is not truly a cryptocurrency, it's always kind of lumped into that bucket and the conversation inevitably goes through cryptocurrency and exchanges and Bitcoin and things of that sort. And I think the regulatory uncertainty has been a, a really big question mark for people. That's starting to change. I would have never thought, having got into the industry five years ago, that by now we would have such uh, guidelines and really... Um, the time and energy of lawmakers and tax authorities to really kind of lay down a framework that allows companies in the space to be operating um, legally and with a known set of requirements that paves the way, although it takes time uh, for tier one financial institutions to come into the space. And then, you know, for institutional investors, right, and traditional equity investors and that type of thing. A really good example of this would be the OCC ruling in the United States earlier this year. To me, that was one of the most fundamental game changing things that happened in the history of our business. And that is where they said that any bank in the United States that is holding a banking license for fiat currency can now also custody cryptocurrency without applying for any new license. And that has been a huge catalyst for these tier one financial institutions to really start to look at and um, you know, sort of uh, really legitimize their cryptocurrency business, right? And it goes from the likes of FinTech unicorns like Robinhood, you know, to the JPMs, right? And the best example of how this is really happening would be the recent announcement from PayPal, where they rolled out the ability to buy cryptocurrency to 350 yeah. million people. Right. And that is just a, you know, built right on that sort of regulatory um, framework that gives companies like that, especially public companies who have fiduciary responsibilities to shareholders around audit, compliance, tax and, you know, regulatory regulators as well. They have to have that comfort level. Right. They can't make big mistakes. Now they have that uh, in the United States. And so we're seeing a monumental shift. It's enough that it's caused me and, and, and my company, BRT, to, to start to offer enterprise products to these tier one financial institutions because suddenly the dam has is, is, you know, <laughs> been, been pulled back or broken. And now there's a lot of interest in you know, these folks looking at custody solutions and other types of software to roll out crypto type investment accounts, right? So I think that's, um, that's a huge game changer. I am seeing, we're seeing at least in Asia where I'm, uh, functioning in like Japan, similar sort of, um, you know, things happening. But there are other areas which are great examples of where the lack of innovation from regulation causes big problems. Uh, South Korea, right? Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, places where um, most aspects of any of these technologies are not allowed by law. Right. And so I think that, you know, like everything else, um, whether it was the Internet or the automobile. Right. It, it takes time for these snowballs to build. Right. Um, but eventually they become too big to stop. And I think we're, we're hitting that inflection point now. Steve, um, what would you say about yeah. that? Inflection That's, uh, point? Uh, Victor, I, I get excited when I hear these conversations because I think, you know, the, the perspective from the Australian pos uh, position and I don't believe for a second what Surin was saying about uh, his, uh, his qualifications and his uh, role in this place, he's probably seeing more opportunity than he's never seen before in his life, which is why he's very understated about the $5 billion he managed. Here's what we see from Australia. The Australian perspective is unique because we notice the rest of the world. We're not a big enough market to just say, notice us. We, you know, we, we have to pay attention to what everyone's doing. So we look across the globe. And I can say right now from the regulatory perspective, when I look at it and I say, okay, what's happening? And when I'm asked, and this is a lot of the conversation I've had in the last 48 hours, what do you see? I say, here's what I see. I see the market in crypto assets being developed in the EU. I see the English framework, which is similar to the one we have in Australia with respect to the way principles-based legal frameworks work. 
I've seen mm. FinCEN in the US changing guidance or discussion papers with respect to how much or what the threshold is of transactions coming in from overseas. I see the Chinese market working very quickly to develop a CBDC, and I also see them simultaneously trying to get pipes that, that deliver information back in. What else do I see? I see FATF giving travel rule guidance that's explicit now. They're saying the travel rule will come, whether people like it or not. I see that coming consistently. I see BIS, I see FSB, all making observations about stable coins. That uncertainty creates opportunities. Now, the question is, where are you in your business cycle? You know, where is, what is your appetite for investment? It's not arbitrage so much where we're looking for a jurisdiction that's not paying attention. The decision over the next 24 and 36 months will be the jurisdictions that are paying attention, that seek to do something, you go, go there. Those opportunities are the ones I think that I'll be encouraging people from Australia to sort of look towards. So that's, you know, for me, that's the opportunity at the moment is there's so much shifting um, that I think at the moment you can no longer say, there's uncertainty necessarily in a bad way or a good way. You just go, there's uncertainty, but there's direction if you're paying. Yeah, I just want to add something. I think oh, uh, you know, if you look at China, right, you know, in regards to their movement to digital currency, it's, it's, it's something that other governments will not ignore and they have to get into the act quickly. <laughs> if they don't, then what you will find is China will push the technology into other emerging world countries, right? And before you know it, there'll be more use of the, et cetera especially in light of the US printing that much of money, right? And, and, and I think everyone sees the game is up, that it, it will just devalue its own currency, which is what's happening right now, while you will find more penetration of, of, of yuan in, in other countries. And there's certainly some significant benefits for governments in being able to monitor, regulate, you know, uh, tax, uh, focus on, on, on growth areas with digital currencies. So I think we can see People are seeing this happening right now, and that's why they're getting more familiar with and more comfortable with investment into, you know, I guess, uh, assets uh, related to uh, digital currencies and digitalization. Sir, and you know, I... that point, so, sorry, I was just going to make one point. That point about China's push into digital yuan being a catalyst for all other major economies to follow suit was made exactly by uh, earlier panelists, uh, US uh, investor panelists actually. Um, so this is uh, one of those very interesting recurring themes that we're hearing uh, again and again, actually throughout the day. Um, and uh, I, I think to, to, to Adam's point, it, it is a very interesting, potentially very important inflection point when, um, you know, some more progressive uh, uh, regulatory regimes are actually leading the charge, uh, case in point Australia uh, and in the digital yuan digital sovereign currency case, uh, um, China, uh, are forcing other countries to no longer be able to sit on the fence. That's right. right. Sir, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that the digital RMB is sort of the uh, pink elephant in the room for not only the cryptocurrency, but the entire global economy over the next two decades. Mm -hmm. I don't think people seem to get it. If you really look at what the um, PRC um, has said, Basically, if you want to do business with China in approximately five years' time, definitely in 10 years' time, you have to support the digital RMB. People wonder all the time, why isn't China adopting all these new international payment standards? Why are they, and trust me, I'm, I'm involved in cross-border payments, right? And we're working with China. You know, it's always a lot of pushback there, right? And the question is, well, gosh, why would they do that? Trading is their business, import exporters, their biggest business. They can't turn those things off, right? Of course, they're going to have to be able to, actually, that's not how they think. Ironically, I think they took a page from the US playbook. The Department of Treasury in the United States, back before the international wire transfer system was set up, created SWIFT in Belgium you know, as an independent consortium and authority, which is probably not true because to get onto the wire transfer network, you have to please the US Department of uh, Treasury, right? And so basically they said, if you wanna be able to send money internationally, you have to conform to the US banking system. Well, guess what? China's become the largest economy in the world. They're just gonna do the same thing. And it's going to be based on the digital RMB, right? Old technology goes out. If you want to trade with China, you have to support their international transfer system. And so I think there's this huge dearth. There's this like, uh, people just don't believe that this could happen. What they don't realize is it's just history repeating itself, right? And the, the temptation, the need to have to work with China is so strong that we really have no choice. But there's a huge dearth in actual movement in this direction. For example, you know, from an Amazon to any global company, right? Nobody's even looking at the digital RMB right now. 
It's just crypto people, digital asset people, right? But all these traditional businesses and financial institutions are going to have to. And I, I don't think people are taking it seriously yet because guys like modern warfare is not fought with guns. It's fought with information and it's fought with money, right? It's economic warfare. What better way to win, right? Even more than China's done already, but to control how money is transferred around the world. I, I should and, add that the previous panelist has actually said, and, and surprising to me, that the Bank of International Settlements has on their website how to download a manual on creating digital currency for central banks. Now that should say a lot to everyone. Mm. And, 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 and I think the, yeah. the other addition there, sorry, Victor, the other addition, which, here's the inverse situation there. The, uh, money is made in margins. So, you know, everyone keeps talking about this thing that's going to grow things 10, 20, 50, 100%. The efficiency that potentially is available to China by saving 1% or 2% or 3% through these systems, these are enormous sums. You know, the biggest businesses mm. in the world are often, you know, Amazon as it grows, just keeps shaving margins. It shaves its own uh, costs by margins. It, it makes sure it can incrementally make more volume sales at a, at a margin that is, you know, very difficult for others to follow. So when I look at something like uh, what China is doing, you know, the information is flowing in. They're going to create better systems. They'll create, create a transparency for themselves. You talk about putting to one side um, the situation for citizens potentially, but for themselves, they'll create a banking system that has greater opportunities for transparency, which means efficiency, which means you get 102 cents in the dollar, 105 cents in the dollar, 110 cents in the dollar. That's, I think, the, that cumulative impact is enormous. And just on that point, I, I absolutely agree with uh, um, that and the previous comments. Um, I, I don't know how many um, um, people in the audience know, but, but actually, despite recent uh, trade and geopolitical tensions between China and Australia, there was a very interesting development that almost slipped through uh, under the radar unnoticed to any out industry outsiders. But um, uh, in the last couple of months, there was a major uh, transaction of iron ore shipment uh, from Australia to China that was actually settled on a blockchain system. It's the first time that this has happened, I believe in the world, um, but certainly between China and Australia. And to Steve's point, I think, even if you can shave just 1% of uh, settlement clearance, traditional legacy financial system um, transfer costs uh, on major commodity uh, exports, such as iron ore, which is, by far Australia's single largest export um, industry and, 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 and item, uh, then, then we're talking about very large quantums indeed. And so uh, the, the possibility of not just uh, digital yuan, but digital iron ore, digital aluminium, digital coal, digital, you name it, uh, commodity, gold, for example, um, I, I think that could be not far away. Um, and you know, Caroline, um, fr from an exchange point of view, um, what, what do you, what, what would you see as some um, opportunities and challenges in embracing some of those latest trends and developments? Could we see, for example, tokenized iron ore or, or other commodities being traded on BDC markets one day soon? Well, uh, wouldn't rule it out, to be honest. I mean, I think we're just, just on that, uh, Australia's point of view with the CBDC, they, they brought out, um, the RBA brought out a paper earlier this year, which was best described as that they're keeping a watching brief on what's happening. I, I, they said that here locally, with the development with the MPP, with our national payments platform, that there isn't currently a need for the likes of a digital currency or a CBDC but that they're keeping an eye on what's happening elsewhere in the world and then we'll revisit this if needed. Now, some people interpreted that as them saying, we're never going to do it or you know, we haven't got an interest in it. But I personally think it's rather a, a savvy thing to do is to say, right, well, you know, right now we're okay, but let's see where this progresses um, you know, with the option to kind of pull the bullet, you know, pull the trigger on it if we need to in time to come. Um, so, so that's, you know, just give the Australian little piece there. I mean, for us, from our point of view, for me, I sit with on at the top of an exchange that right now trades a limited amount of digital assets. And I can sit and look with my background in from IB at all the opportunities that are coming down the track that are now presenting themselves. I agree with every point that's been made across this whole discussion. And I also agree with points that were made in the previous discussion where they're talking about the role of STOs and where that's going to develop in, in for the business. And for me, I'm kind of sitting here quietly smiling and nodding only because I'm in complete agreement with the points that people are making. 
I would not be remotely surprised and in fact would be very heartened if I'm in a situation where I can open out the, the amazing benefits of this technology and the, to the exchange that I'm, I'm sort of top of um, to the rest of the Australian economy. Right now, what's holding me back or what's holding us back is uh, playing regulatory catch up. But my hope is that exactly as Steve had spoken about, that fantastic 168 page draft legislation that came out of the European Union with their, uh, with that MICA, with the Markets and Cryptocurrency Act, my hope is that something as well developed and thought through as that will spread um, and have a ripple effect, um, pardon the pun, through the rest of, of the globalized economy. I, I would, you know, that's the dream scenario for me because that gives me something for, as an exchange to work with. I can build a framework around that. I can develop the rest of the markets around that. But right now where we're sitting at this point in December, 2020, that hasn't yet happened, but come back to me in June, come back to me in December of next year and, and let's see where we are with it. I think there's a real appetite for it. I think there's real hunger. I think that there's a real opportunity globally not just here locally in Australia for something like this. Um, and, and from our point of view, you know, we've got the technology and we're ready to go with it. We're, we're just bursting at the seams of excitement to, to get ahead. All I can see, you know, that yes, there's challenges, but there's so much opportunity here. Um, and and that's, that's why I, you know, I get up every morning and just kind of jump into my job. I'm just so excited yeah. about what's to come. Probably similar to what Adam is as, as well. I'm sure he's the same. I mean, you're, you're juggling a lot of different, different balls in the air there, but they're all I mean, this is an absolute dream, a dream time to be in this industry. And yeah, I relish it. You know what it feels like to me, Caroline? It feels like when I first came to the Silicon Valley in the late 90s, in the early days of the internet infrastructure boom and before the dot-com bubble. And I just, you know, at that time I felt, I just feel, you know, happy and lucky to be a part of something like this. Right. Something so big, right? I feel that again. I never thought I'd feel that again in my life, but I, I feel that again now and I think it's even bigger. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly. So it's just so exciting and, and, and gives its own energy and, and momentum and motivation to keep going. Because let's be honest, like every day in my job, we're trying to solve problems that have never been solved before. Or if they've never been solved before in Australia or they've never been, who gets a job like that every day? I get paid to do that. This is amazing. You know, like this is such an exciting time to be in. Particularly in such a traditional industry, I've always been viewed such, a, you know, to hold such traditional roles and functions. To be like, okay, well, we've got a whiteboard. <laughs> Let's just go for our lives and see what we can make from it. So yes, it, and this is, you know, these are the kind of conversations myself and Steve have when we do meet up here in Melbourne and just kind of shoot the breeze on, well, <laughs> what new kind of solution have you come up today? Uh, come up with today? Like, how have you reimagined these problems? And and then the wider community here, because it is, as, as Steve has said, it's so interconnected not just within Australia, but within the whole region and, and beyond, you know, people are, are, want to share their solutions. People want to share their knowledge. They want to push the boundaries forward and, and bring other people with it. And but coming from traditional financial services, that has not always been the case. And so to be in, as you say, in that group, I mean, still being competitive and you still want to, you know, be the first and that, you know, that doesn't go away, but you still want to work with everybody and, and share it. And yeah, it's just fantastic. It's, uh, it's amazing, I can't, we can't keep Caroline on her, on her seat and we can't keep Steve from uh, talking about 50 miles an hour and everyone's really excited. But I would, <laughs> I'd encourage you, uh, some of you guys, to actually uh, look at some of the content that we, create, uh, that we collected over the last two days. It, it's amazing, it's amazing, it's, it's really exciting. You know, and we've got to worry a little bit about, as you said, not worry, but be, be cognizant of what's going to happen with, with the... Uh, uh, the Chinese currency. I mean, because if you start to look at the whole Silk Road initiative that's been happening and the amount of um, funding that they've put through Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, the Caribbean now, you've got to start wondering really how much clout that they carry. And if you don't pay attention to that, it's like, hey, this is what we want, whether you like it or not. So um, it's an interesting point. And and all of you are playing in such an interesting area with developing technologies or markets uh, and moving that whole ball forward. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it was the 2020 pandemic that created this focus and the ability of people to connect like this, like we are doing today and exchange ideas and, and the whole topic of currency and liquidity and stimulus has created this sort of... Uh, 
I don't know, what do you call this? It's just like a, a confluence of, of factors that may just change the way the economy progresses or digresses from this point on. Who knows, right? And so the real question, and I, and um, the real question, I mean, there is a question for Adam by Seal by one of our uh, audiences, the diehard um, uh, audience that we've got left at this day and hour. And, and uh, there is a question I would like Adam to answer. Uh, Adam, you, you, you can see that question, right? Yep, I, I can see it. Thank you very much, and Kareem. Then, yeah. and then after you've answered that question, what I'd like for each of us to do is spend 60 seconds uh, to close this out, uh, starting with Caroline, Steve, um, Adam, Suren, and Victor, and give us your thoughts for 2021. Uh, 20 has been difficult. We've learned, we've seen a lot. We've learned a little bit more. Uh, let's, be, uh, let's be mindful of 2021 and, and uh, spend 60 seconds after that, after Adam's answered the question about what your thoughts are for 2021. Okay, sure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kareem. So the, the question that came up from one of the attendees was related to Ripple's XRP and whether or not uh, their business model, for example, will change if and when it is declared uh, as something like a commodity or a currency or a security, according to the question. So uh, I, unfortunately, uh, I can't speculate on the price of XRP, uh, <laughs> for sure. Um, however, I, I will say this, you know, one of, the, one of the things that Bitcoin or Ethereum enjoys is regulatory, at least in the United States, from the SEC perspective, right? Um, and for better or for worse, a lot of things flow down from that internationally as well, right? So one of the things that Bitcoin and Ethereum enjoy is, is that they're a known factor, right? And they've been declared not to be a security, right? And so just that regulatory sort of um, you know, decision and that comfort level with there being guidelines specifically for this, you know, this uh, digital asset really opens the door for a lot more, especially large institutions and companies, such as in Ripple's case, tier one financial institutions to look at using technology from that company um, to you know, revolutionize cross-border payments and whatnot. So regulatory certainty, I think is always good for any company. I think it's also good for our industry. Right. I, I apologize because I'm pretty sure you want some more information on what I think is going to happen with regards to, you know, anything that the SEC is going to say. And, you know, I, very much like anyone else here, we just don't know. We really honestly don't. Um, you know, what we do know is that because of the uh, transition in the White House in the United States, uh, that there are a lot of changes, uh, as there always are during especially a one party to another type of transition, a lot of changes in key areas of the U.S. government, including usually the uh, SEC and, you know, many, many other places. And so I think that generally speaking, you find a Democratic administration in the United States a little bit more um, open to Silicon Valley tech companies, fintech companies, whereas you find the Republicans, you know, to be a little bit more pro-traditional big business. You've seen this huge fight between Facebook and Twitter and the White House and all this kind of stuff, right? So, you know, I think from the perspective of not Ripple, but just Silicon Valley and fintech and tech companies in general, I think that things are, you know, probably going to get better. Uh, and I always feel that regular, regulatory certainty is good. So no matter what you know, might or might not happen with regards to Ripple or XRP or something of that sort, any type of certainty is going to be a good thing, I think, and it's going to help that company be more successful. Mm. Will I jump in with my predictions for 21? Yes, <laughs> make, it, make it really hopeful. Um, positive. I don't or, or, or not. To honest, if you have or not. <laughs> First of all, I think or anyone... Not. Cool. No, 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 no. Have fun with it. We're the only ones left in the room. <laughs> I can see the recording light is still on. There's no way I'm putting yes. this out. Now, I think anyone is a fool in this industry to make any predictions, certainly publicly. Um, privately over a glass of wine, that's a different thing entirely. But what I do think is, and it kind of was something that we talked about earlier, was about in 2020, yet again, as an industry sector, we were tested. We were tested in very different and new ways, but we were not found wanting. And I think if anything, the experiences of this year have really strengthened the resolve and strengthened the community in a way that will really help the focus for what is to come in 2021 and beyond. And I think the industry really needed that. It's almost been a sense of, uh, almost like a consolidation 
and a strengthening of the backbone, if you like, uh, within the industry. And that's certainly been my perception of it. And just the, the, the caliber and the quality of, of um, counterparties who are coming in now, it's just streets and streets ahead. It's just growing and growing and growing. Um, and the stakeholders that are moving in likewise. So with that, you're just going to see, I would predict, um, uh, just growing on the trends that we saw that started this year. But again, that, that sense of strengthening within the industry. I can pass the baton now over to Steve. So uh, the, the three quick points in a strange jurisdiction, I speak for this jurisdiction only, is that I recognise there's so much happening. Um, you should, and we will fish where the fish are. The government has made it very clear what their areas of interest are. You should go to those interests. At first instance, do that. That's point number one. Um, point number two for me is we do less, oh, sorry, we do more with less. It's a difficult thing for us. Our, our markets don't have a lot of deep liquidity as some others might uh, globally. So the reality here is people are much more appreciative of sums of money if it drives your innovation. So I think we can extract more because we recognise it's the case. Australia as an ecosystem doesn't invest in blue sky the way, uh, the way other more mature ecosystems potentially do. And the third part is we're open for business. I mean, this is an environment we're encouraging this conversation at the moment. We want inbound. Part of the national blockchain roadmap uh, agenda item, it's there listed as one of the things we want to do. We want inbound interest and inbound investment. We're saying we're open for business. And we're lucky to be. So they're the three points from my perspective, what 2021 looks like. Okay, I guess I will go next, Victor. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, Adam or? Yeah, sure, no, no yeah, problem. Adam. So um, I was gonna say, while I, can, while I can't comment on the uh, situation in Australia, I can certainly do so from my perspective, at least globally. And that is, I think that we're finally gonna really cross the chasm in 2021 when it comes to more widespread adoption of interest in cryptocurrency investing from mainstream investors, the kind of people that, not the early adopters where you find like the Robin Hood crowd, which are the young millennials with some discretionary income, but the more traditional folks. And that's because we're seeing you know, with some of those regulatory sort of um, guidelines coming out and whatnot that I mentioned, you know, we're seeing traditional investment banks like Fidelity or Charles Schwab, JPM, who have literally hundreds of thousands of feet on the street in terms of financial advisors and, you know, investment advisors, right, uh, to encourage people to make an investment in something that has probably performed better than any commodity or any currency since its inception. I'm talking about Bitcoin in this case, right? And to, you know, sort of educate with this um, exciting, you know, technology that's out there. So I think as you see that, that coupled with the fact that this regulatory certainty that I referred to makes it easier for institutions to come in, uh, I think we're going to continue to see um, a wild ride in crypto uh, fluctuations and volatility. You've got this really weird sort of confluence of events where you've got consumers coming in, institutions coming in, but because this is crypto and it's global and the markets never close and anyone can do it, right? You also get all these options traders and all like the heavy hitting, you know, um, data people from Wall Street and all this writing scripts and they can automate things in ways that they could, it took decades to figure out how to do in traditional securities, right? And they could still only do it between like 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. in traditional securities, right? So they come in too and suddenly the market is some weird combination of super immature and super mature together. Right. And that's what I think creates some of that volatility. But to me, like Caroline said, it's super exciting. So I think that it's going to be a great year uh, for crypto. Um, this year has been such a terrible year for the whole world. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say it, it's been pretty good for crypto. And I think, you know, as people examine, uh, continue to examine in 2021, we come out of this pandemic, vaccines start coming out and they think, you know, I want to reconsider. I, I came close to a brush with death or I knew people who got sick or who passed away, God forbid, right? I want to reconsider a lot of things in my life, right? What's important to me? Health and money and family, right? Money is a pretty pivotal one. So I think that also is going to encourage people to look at alternative investments and digital assets. And that's just one side of it. Then you've got things like China and CBDCs and all this other stuff coming in, right, at the same time. So to me, this is going to be the most exciting year yet. Uh, to be honest, I probably could have said that any year over the last five years I've been in the industry and I probably would have been right. So pretty easy to say, right? Um, but I think this year we're going to see the biggest growth and really cross that chasm from the early adopter stage to something that's, you know, in the, in the first part of mainstream. Sure. Wow, I think it's all been said, but I'll make a macro perspective here. Um, I think the huge amount of um, quantitative easing is going to create a huge disjoint and more pronounced in some countries than others, especially the US, 
where I think there'll be a huge uh, distrust between the haves and the have-nots. And I think people will get disillusioned of traditional fiat currencies um, and therefore look for other geographies and other opportunities. And now to give a part for Australia, I think you'll see a lot more funds flow into Australia because of a lot of factors. One, low COVID numbers. Two, strong <laughs> governance. Three, transparency. And, um, you know, a, a very egalitarian society. And, and, and because of its very um, uh, safe um, fund management hub in Australia, you'll see a lot of money into funds, fund managers um, that will provide you know, good futuristic returns than simply what traditional assets have offered. So from my point of view, uh, I'm gonna uh, look forward to the opportunity of finding you know, um, opportunities in this digital space. We've seen platforms, we've seen some recent IPOs that have just been unbelievable. I mean, you know, I'm actually also in the mental well-being space and we've just seen Calm recently, you know, have this amazing, enormous, you know, uh, growth. So um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity of uh, more funds flowing to Australia and utilizing that to further build on, you know, this whole digitalization and the cryptocurrencies and, and blockchain. Fantastic. Well, um, <laughs> I guess it's all been pretty much said, but um, before I make um, my predictions for 2021, I want to say uh, the, 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 the last two days of um, content and, and insight has been absolutely, hands down, phenomenal. And I, I really wish that, that this continues on a periodic basis. And I genuinely, I'm sure uh, Karim will, will, will echo this, I would love to have you back as uh, speakers and, and panelists to share more. And uh, Caroline and Steve, you're very welcome to shoot the breeze, uh, not only uh, out of uh, Melbourne, but also digitally with, with a global community of like-minded uh, innovators, uh, thought leaders and, and investors. Um, and we are doing more things um, uh, between Link2 and Sapien Group uh, on uh, reaching more close and more, more frequent communications uh, through, through a digital asset special interest uh, group. So not only do we have to wait for uh, major events like this, uh, but actually people can more freeform message and, and collaborate with each other uh, within such a community. So um, I, I, um, I'm really, really excited about uh, uh, that sort of um, opportunity and platforms coming. So. So I guess my prediction for 2021 will be somewhat related to that. And, and that is, um, I absolutely agree with everything that Steve and Adam and Caroline and Surin has said. And I think what that basically will mean is that you're going to see uh, more cross-border investing happening in the digital asset space. Um, and in particular, in, in what you would con traditionally consider private equity, except with tokenized assets that are listed on exchanges, what is private, what is public, it's a blurry line, right? Um, but I think um, it, uh, particularly to Adam's point about, you know, the, those institutions, uh, very sophisticated um, algorithmic based trading and investing uh, that are, you know, available now in, in a market that basically is global and never sleeps, will see far more likelihood of uh, cross border transactions large and small and, and um, small ones in the case of you know uh, what, what link to has been able to do for example to, to facilitate uh, almost micro uh, private equity investments into unicorns um, and I, I genuinely believe there will be a lot more of that happening in 2021 especially if uh, as Surin's predictions hold out that more capital will flow into Australia um, hopefully um, then um, you know, that, that, that could mean a lot of um, cross-border opportunities and projects um, and exciting endeavors being um, better funded. And as a venture capitalist and, and a private equity investor, I think that's gonna be super exciting. And we certainly are looking at a couple of um, uh, cross-border investment opportunities, uh, initially by equity, but, but certainly um, a, a, a way to tokenize them those projects um, ourselves as a Sapien group. So um, with that, I, I want to pass it back to Karim to uh, quite a wrap for today's proceedings.